Neste taler er nok en gang på engelsk. The ultimate aim, of course, of this white paper, the stortingsmelding, as with actually everything else that you've seen so far, is of course to change something. And I'm very happy to introduce a man who actually wants to change the world, no less. Our next speaker is an award-winning graphic designer who regards graphic design as a precision lens that focuses our attention and brings clarity to all aspects of our lives. Michael Beirut is a partner at the New York branch of Pentagram, the world's largest independent design consultancy. His work includes brand identity, book design, packaging, and environmental graphics. And his clients have included the New York Times, MIT Media Lab, and Princeton University, as well as the New York Jets and Hillary Clinton. Michael has also focused on design writing and a reflective practice. He launched the Design Observer website in 2003, and a book on his work, How to Use Graphic Design to Sell Things, Explain Things, Make Things Look Better, Make People Laugh, Make People Cry, and Every Once in a While Change the World, was published in 2015. Obviously, you need to be a very good graphic designer to fit all that on the front of a book. And his collection of new essays, Now You See It, was published in the fall of 2017. Please welcome Michael Beirut. Um, thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, uh, Doga, for inviting me to um, Oslo. This is the first time I've ever been to Norway. Uh, obviously to Oslo, and it's just been a beautiful experience so far. I've enjoyed today, and I've enjoyed all the sunshine and warmth in your beautiful city. So thank you for that. It is warm. It's, as long as the sun is out, I'm happy. And the sun rose at 9, 10 a.m. this morning. That's not good. But you can't help that, can you? Um, so I do work in New York. I'm a graphic designer. So I'm not a theorist. I'm not a policymaker. I'm not a uh, uh, academic. I'm really just a working designer. So I'm going to show you some pieces of graphic design. The first one, not by me, then a couple of things that I did work on uh, for the public sector with the goal uh, to affect some sort of a social change. Um, and I'll talk, I hope, candidly about the challenges that attend that sort of ambition. I do say on the cover, in parentheses, every once in a while, change the world. And I could, had I had more room, I would have said, if you're lucky. And I hope you're lucky. Um, so um, I, I'm going to talk about how to do some other things first. This is, um, uh, uh, this morning, uh, Rachel Armstrong talked about the sixth great extinction. Um, you could argue that a lot of the prerequisites for that were established right at the very end of World War II, when uh, the Americans, on behalf of the Allied forces, effectively ended that war by dropping two atomic bombs on the island of Japan. Um, the scientists involved with that effort were heroes in one way. Uh, they created this incredible new wartime technology that they imagined would have peaceful uses, but they also acknowledged how terrifying that technology was. They had unleashed a force upon the world uh, that would not just be used for good, but also could be used for tremendous evil. So this guy's Arthur Langsdorff Jr. He's a, one of the atomic scientists who worked on the building of the atomic bomb in the 40s, and one of the scientists who subsequent to that led an effort to reconsider how nuclear power could be contained, controlled, channeled for good, and kept out of the wrong hands. He established a, uh, a publication with some colleagues called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists that was a, a forum to exchange information about uh, uh, containing nuclear proliferation and in the long run uh, trying to evade that sixth extension that uh, uh, Professor Armstrong talked about this morning. Um, it was a magazine, it was a piece of graphic design, and these were a bunch of scientists who didn't fancy themselves magazine designers. Luckily, uh, Professor Langsdorff was married to an artist named Marta Langsdorff, who's shown here. And he asked her, when they started the magazine, if she could design something to decorate the cover. And she had, through an, uh, an act of intuition, an idea of something that would fit on the cover. And in 1947, I think, they launched, and this was the first cover she did. Um, 
In the background are the hands of a clock uh, set at around 8 to midnight, or 8 to 12, but let's assume it's midnight. Um, and she did it because she thought it looked good in that position. What she inadvertently created, however, um, for, as a gift in a way to those scientists, was a way to reduce all their research, all their ac academic uh, uh, work, all the theorizing they were doing, all the advocacy they hoped to do to a single metric. And the scientists, God bless them, understood what they had, and they said, Martel, what we want to do is use the hands of the clock to keep track of how close we are to ending the world through nu nuclear annihilation. And so they introduced something that became known informally as the doomsday clock. So the doomsday clock actually had an inventor, Martel Langsdorf, and what's powerful about it is in a single graphic gesture, she manages to combine both the precision timekeeping that we associate with the end of, with action sequences in movies, where the bomb is about to go off, it inherently instills tension and urgency, and it also is a scientific instrument measurement. And it, by forcing a lot of complex information down to a single number, it sort of makes something that's unthinkable comprehensible. Um, and, and comprehensible and has the capacity, of course, to be sensationalized, too. Uh, but the bullet in the atomic scientist much later, about um, uh, 60 years after that, came around to us and said, we've never had a logo. We'd like you to design a logo for us. And I said, what do you mean you've never had a logo? You have a logo. The logo is, that is Martel Langsdorf's clock. So we just said, why don't you have a logo that it could be a changeable logo? You change the number every year. And uh, that way, you know, you could always sort of incorporate that sense of urgency right into the way you're communicating your name and your purpose. Of course, that last one, uh, 12 o'clock, presumably none of us are around to enjoy that logo and its unveiling because uh, we're just picking through the ashes. But uh, it was introduced in the magazine, and we sort of continue to work with them and do uh, the annual update of the clock, which is an announcement that uh, is tracking not just nuclear uh, proliferation, but now climate change, bio-warfare, all the kinds of ways that, all those man-made ways that we are inventing to threaten our own existence here on this planet. And so um, it continues in the United States and around the world as an advocacy uh, organization, as a research organization. At the heart of it all is this very simple motif of that clock. Um, I regret to say it has now been moved as close as it's ever been to midnight, thanks to the um, uh, current leadership we have in, uh, uh, in the United States, I think largely. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, Irena uh, Bauman was talking about um, uh, human uh, weakness, she sort of named three things, greed, xenophobia, and vanity, which more or less constitutes the three pillars of uh, the current uh, United States administration, if you ask me. So. As you'll see, we've, we, we all work to try to avoid that catastrophe, but not smartly enough and not well enough, I guess. I'm going to show you a fairly benign and, to my mind, kind of easy and non-controversial public sector project I did. I noted uh, that um, uh, Christian just uh, talked about uh, from nations to cities as being one of the themes that uh, uh, could be about the future of design. In New York City, we had some real visionary leadership under our former mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who is a billionaire, but a very smart and capable billionaire, who appointed some sensational uh, uh, commissioners to run various departments, including Jeanette Sadek Khan, a, a transportation theorist who was in charge of the Department of Transportation. She initiated a project uh, called Walk NYC, which uh, aims to um, uh, come up with, uh, uh, basically to advocate for, for pedestrians in, um, in New York City. And we got a big assignment to come up with a pedestrian wayfinding system, similar to other ones that are in major cities around the world, except this one is coping with a particularly complicated and crazy city, which is New York City. Um, and so, um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity that goes into how you even do wayfinding in something as relatively simple as a major airport in a city where anyone can be entering any point, anyone can have any destination, people can be in a hurry, people can be wandering around, people can be, uh, be their first day in town. 
they can be on a habitual commute they've been doing for 20 years. Everyone has different needs. Everyone has different ideas. Uh, when they um, uh, decided to launch it, the uh, idea was to do it indeed uh, with a little bit of pilot fatigue, to do three, uh, then four, then ultimately five major pilots in areas uh, um, around New York City. Uh, this entailed interviewing a lot of people, and I think we managed to actually explore. Uh, uh, Dr. Osby was talking about memory and how that works. You'd ask people how they got around in New York and to draw a map of what their journey was, and they would draw these peculiar sausage-like shapes being intersected by pieces of spaghetti adjacent to... Um, you know, kumquats or eggplants or something. So, uh, and this is completely geographically insane, by the way. There's no relationship to any land masses on Earth, never mind, uh, you know, uh, North America. Um, but all this information had to be compiled, sorted out, then turned into something comprehensible. Uh, that comprehensible system we were asked to design actually uh, sits in the middle of a big web of other wayfinding systems that control the subways, control bus travel, control automobile travel in New York, and then continue on to the subways and other places, and indeed on to objects that you might have on your, in your hand or in your pocket, right? Um, and so the, uh, uh, the, the idea we, that we came up with, of course, is some pylons, not electrified, not interactive, simple uh, analog objects, that would uh, be placed in various places around the city. And so we had to come up with a language that was right for New York. And luckily, we had a really nice precedent in um, the work that my mentor, Massimo Vignelli, had done in the 1960s when he did the signage system for uh, the New York City subways. Very simple signs with um, Helvetica, on white on black, with round dots representing the subway lines all um, uh, memorialized in what has now become a fetish object, this 1968 graphic standards manual, passed around as if it's, um, you know, the, you know the, the, the holy grail among graphic design nerds, at least. Uh, we did an adaptation of uh, Helvetica just for the Department of Transportation, where we did some kooky little changes, like changing the, uh, the, the tittles over the I's and J's to dots, so it could be for the Department of Transportation dot, to give a, a kind of uh, traditional uh, or a, a proprietary typeface they could use, a color scheme that was largely neutral except for some <clears throat> taxi cab yellow, uh, jolts of energy, and then did an analysis of uh, icons that we could match to that uh, uh, um, alphabet, and uh, they look like regular icons except we have taken care to reconcile each of them to the uh, geometry of the typeface because they all have to coexist in such close quarters. So if you're ever in New York and you want to astound your friends, you can point out to them that uh, the curve of the C is exactly the same as the curve in the part of the bus icon. And, uh, you, you may, and if you have any friends after that, you can discuss it over coffee. Uh, <clears throat> We also had to uh, figure out a way to um, uh, represent the iconic buildings and other landmarks in New York. Um, most of these, New York buildings oddly, I think aren't really viewed in the round as much as they're viewed just in elevation somehow. And so um, luckily that means you can kind of represent them as flat objects and that entailed kind of taking real things and reducing them through a series of uh, um, interns, basically. I can't think of any other words to describe it. Hardworking interns devoting hours to drawing these things until we had a complete suite of about uh, 300 of these icons to deploy all over the city. And then ultimately, um, uh, all reconciled together into um, objects that were designed to, uh, to kind of resemble classic modernist late 20th century, early 21st century uh, New York City architecture. All modular, as I said, not electric, not digital. Um, in, uh, assembled off-site, delivered in the dark of night, and unveiled in the morning as a new way to get around the city. Um, the, uh, there, are, there are some instances where it's been tied up with the bus system where uh, uh, there's a little bit of electronics added to it. But for the most part, it actually just is um, um, as, like, the assumption being that uh, not everyone, not everyone has a phone or a GPS. And there's also something antisocial about people all clutching their phones, walking around, arguing about what their competing GPS systems are telling them to do. And so nice, 
on the other hand, to, um, uh, to just kind of group around a map and plan your day. Where will we go next? Oh, we can stop here. And indeed, the cunning and diabolical uh, you know, subtext to all this work is that it's meant to make people more healthy by showing how close it is to walk to places. It's meant to encourage economic development because as you're walking, you might stop in a small store and buy a cup of coffee or a sandwich. And it's meant to obviously reduce the stress on the environment by getting people out of cars and onto their feet. Um, people keep saying, can you handle the weather here? It's not, you know, it's not so bad here in, uh, in Oslo, actually. Um, so this is actually about pure politics. About four years ago, I got a phone call from a mysterious client who was representing a, uh, uh, someone who uh, was entertaining an idea about running for president, and that turned out to be Hillary Clinton. Um, and so I was asked whether I would do a logo for uh, uh, Secretary, then Secretary of State Clinton's campaign, and uh, she had not had, to my eyes, a... Uh, uh, a great record in terms of graphic design. I admired her very much in terms of her politics, policies, everything else. Uh, her taste in typefaces uh, needed something to be desired, but at least they were asking some experts for help, and I applauded that. Of course, the gold standard for this was established by Barack Obama, who actually introduced the idea of having a logo for your campaign. Until then, people just take their names, put a flag behind it, and a big slogan, and kind of like just do that whatever way the whatever way anyone wanted to do for the moment. Uh, Obama, I think because he was such an unknown quantity, uh, was advised to kind of make everything look just so buttoned up it would be beyond reproach, and he set that standard. And I think particularly between 2004, 2008, and then uh, in 2012, uh, when by the time Hillary was running for the, tw for the 2016 campaign, the idea that you'd somehow have to represent the campaign as an icon on a watch, as a small you know, thing in the corner of a social media app, really requires that kind of reductive quality. So we embarked on a um, quest to find a, uh, a suitable mark. The, you, know the, you, know the, you know how this story goes, including its terrible denouement, but I'll uh, uh, take you through it. Uh, a lot of different things were considered, and somehow the idea that um, this simple letter form, the H, combined with an arrow that could point beyond the H, point into the future, ended up being the thing that uh, seemed to be uh, uh, provocative and the most useful. What I also liked about it, and I was very dedicated to this, was um, taking advantage of something that had happened with um, Barack Obama's campaign. When Obama had run, they were actually surprised when people started like making their own handmade versions of his logo. And his logo is really complicated. It has lots of curves. The geometry of it is actually pretty hard to do. I remember saying in our office, I want to do something so simple that a, like a, a four-year-old can do it with a pair of scissors and some glue and some colored paper. I just want it that simple. I don't want to do anything complicated. And, uh, and so we did something that was, in fact, that simple. It's all just 90-degree angles, 45-degree angles. This was a little uh, uh, brochure we did that introduced it. It had a custom typeface uh, that was used consistently all the way through. Uh, the geometry is simple as pi, or really easy. Uh, color schemes that could be expanded out. Uh, rules for how that typeface was used. And then rules for how the logo and the typeface would work together all put in place and ready to deploy, things not to do, of course, things you could do with that arrow on its own, all this other stuff. And then um, we sort of said what would be fun, though, is if people could, could put things in that H and adapt it on their own. So we had, you could put pictures in it, you could put water in it, you could do all these different things, you could um, uh, you know, make a crossword puzzle out of it, a subway map, you could do it for the Academy Awards or Valentine's Day. Uh, you could do all sorts of different things with it if you wanted. as shown there, right? And then finally we said, you know, and then, you know, it could be merchandised a lot of different ways. And we sort of like did all these like little mock-ups and prototypes just to show what could happen. And then ultimately turned it over to the campaign and said, um, uh, happy to be of service. This is all volunteer work. And so we said, um, hope it works. Uh, and so it launches and the, um, uh, the first comment that I saw on Twitter was, <laughs> what lucky third grader won the Hillary 
Clinton campaign, you know. Then people noted that uh, it reminded them of the signs we have for, you know, the hospital is this way. Um, other people had still darker and more frightening interpretations like that. Not good. Uh, remember back then there was this fairly jolly controversy about that dress that might have been white or gold or black. So someone, all these different interpretations. And then finally, um, you know, I really just wanted to help. And uh, I found myself having to respond to um, articles like this. Uh, design actors trashed the logo. Um, but then what started happening, and, and it, was so, it was funny, when I was listening to Rachel Armstrong talk about organic design, I was trying to translate into what that means for graphic design. And I think part of it is you take something and you put it in a Petri dish, and then you watch how it evolves. And of course, some of the ways it evolves can be malignant, but some of the ways can be benign and energetic. And so some guy just made a whole alphabet out of it. And then, to my pleasure, the campaign actually said, okay, let's use that alphabet, right? Um, and then people found, you know, indeed you could do it really simply on the beach. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, people would send in their things and they would use it as stuff. I think it really came of age uh, on the day that uh, uh, marriage equality, uh, the rights of, uh, of gay people to marry was argued in front of the Supreme Court. And uh, <clears throat> uh, they, um, sorry, uh, you know, that was uh, the day that they um, argued, Obergefell's was the case uh, uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, the campaign changed all the icons in their, in their communications feed to be like this. And suddenly then, no one had, you know, I think the whole idea that people like me had, had inculcated to the world was that if you have a logo, the most important thing is consistency. And the idea that consistency wasn't just being tolerated, but was being embraced, inconsistently, inconsistency was being tolerated and embraced was sort of a new thing. And so suddenly then, wow, you know, uh, Hillary changed his logo to back gay marriage. And all of a sudden then people came to understand that the malleability of this logo could actually be a plus. So it turns out that it's not horrible, it's perfect. But, so what was exciting was watching then this thing kind of metastasize into all sorts of different forms from a giant platform. Uh, there was a really uh, smart design team in Brooklyn that played it out, um, adapting it to everything from back-end code to children's blocks to um, podium signs to tales of planes to uh, pictures. All sorts of different things, as you can see, right? And people could make it by hand, with just magic markers, a little bit of tape, kind of like people realize you turn that H sideways and into an I. Wisconsin is famous for cheese. You can make it out of cheese. <laughs> you can make it out of, um, uh, you know, you make a little crocheted memento. You know, you can cut it into pie. There was one lady who um, made a different one every single day and posted it on Facebook. And there was a, a friend of a friend of a friend told me about it. And so she started donating these to the campaign. And then finally came um, election night and I got to be 15 feet from the stage where the candidate would come out. And that's me that night looking so happy early in the evening. You know how that story ended. Um, I think uh, there's, that, you know, the analysis of why it ended, why it ended has very little to do with graphic design, if you ask me, <laughs> except, except I think when people ask the difference between what, a logo and a brand, Hillary Clinton had a logo, and I think a good logo, but Donald Trump had a brand. And that brand sort of doesn't even require anything resembling coherence. It sort of is all-encompassing, and people are willing to ascribe anything he does to supporting that brand. And I think very few people have that. Very, like, very few companies have that. You know, cartoon characters might have that, and, and indeed, uh, uh, we got one. So, uh, however, um, I'm fortified by moments like this where uh, indeed a three-year-old or maybe a kindergartner did draw that with a nice message. And so that sort of is what I think, if there's a positive thing, we'll see that in all the activity that's happening that's leading up through the midterms, which you just had last November and going into the election season we'll have next, where we will, uh, 
I know some, there's a congresswoman who called him a motherfucker, and so I guess I can too. Uh, we'll see if we can get him moved on to his next uh, uh, phase in life that won't involve ours. Uh, so th finally, this is, um, that was an attempt to save the world of graphic design. This is how you actually do it by accident. Um, I got asked by an organization called the Robin Hood Foundation to do what sounded like a simple project. They had started something called uh, uh, the Library Initiative, and what they were going to do was go into derelict New York City public schools who are lar largely in really old, drafty, you know, buildings that really need repair, particularly in neighborhoods that are less wealthy, that are at risk. Uh, these facilities are not in great shape. To completely renovate them from top to bottom would be an enormous amount of money. But this foundation thought, if we went in and just did a single room in each of those buildings, uh, we could do some good. And the room they chose was the school library. And so they started this thing called uh, uh, the Library Initiative, and they asked me if I would do, again, the logo for it. Now, why does it need a logo? It needs a logo because they were doing fundraising for it. They were doing, you know, it was, it was a, um, you know, a, public, a public sector project, and they wanted to have public visibility. And they thought unless you name it and center it on an image, it wouldn't really play out. And, I, and they asked me to donate my time, and I thought it was a great cause. And I said, sure, I can do a logo. This is what I do. So I said, uh, uh, you know, renovating libraries, stand back, I got this, I said. So I said, this is the presentation I showed them when I first, when I came back with my free ideas. Um, I said, okay, it's about um, uh, these new libraries. So it's a new idea, it needs a new name. We're not going to call them libraries because people think libraries are boring, right? So we're going to call this something fresh and exciting, like, say, the reading room, right, where you're allowed to talk, where you're not hushed, right? I thought, what a great idea. How about that? Huh? But wait, there's more. What if you called it OWL, uh, One World Library, OWL, and you have, like, this all-seeing eye? Wouldn't kids want to go to OWL? That was my reason. So then, uh, so then, wait, I got one more. And I said, okay, what if you call it the red zone? Because like red is like, I read that book, but it's also like red, like the color. You get it? Um, now, so somehow, <laughs> somehow, like that last one particularly, I, the idea that, that librarians sort of care about spelling um, eluded me somehow. I thought the, the, the pun was just so charming that I thought it would supersede any qualms they had about you know, basic literacy, but uh, um, it did not. And in fact, um, my contact at the foundation, who was uh, the main person who was the interface with the uh, New York City School, said, well, listen, Michael, um, those are cute ideas and everything, but the premise you have is faulty because you're assuming these kids are bored with libraries. In fact, these kids don't know what libraries are. Their school libraries are so awful that, you know, it's not like they're boring and quiet. In, on the contrary, they're in complete disarray. They're completely uncared for. And so really, they don't really need a new name. We don't have to reinvent this. We just need to kind of like call it what it is. So I said, okay, what if it just is this? It's like, library, but with an exclamation point, but then you put it in the middle, and then you make it red. So it's a library like with a surprise inside. And they said, thank you. Okay, so that was what they wanted. <laughs> so these libraries were being designed by um, uh, what were then, this started about 15 years ago, and it went on for 10 years after that. It was designed by um, young, mid-career, up-and-coming architects, uh, Todd Williams and Billy Chen, uh, Richard Gluckman, uh, Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi, David Rockwell. Uh, um, so they were all doing different libraries, and I was going to be the consulting graphic designer to show them how to stick this logo on their library. And for the most part, it was pretty easy. You could make that exclamation point into a door, put a big sign above the door that said library with the fun exclamation point. Then one of the architects came to me and said, look, I, that's fine, but I got another problem here. The problem is that I'm in a room that has really high ceilings. It's an old building, and the shelves can only go up high enough for a kid to reach. So I've got about, you know, um, two meters or so above that top shelf that I got nothing to put there. And, um, you know, you're the graphic designer, right? Can you do something? And I said, whoa, I'm, I'm, I, did, I got this logo that I did for free. Um, you know, you're really asking me to be, you know, a muralist, and I'm not a muralist, right? And he said, come on. And so I said, okay, what if we 
took pictures of the kids in the school and kind of made a heroic sort of freeze of the kids around the top, sort of almost in, in a classical mode. And then they could be oversized, kind of looking in at the, the real kids in the room as if, you know, as if this was like a little like model or dollhouse or something. And so that was the original idea. And the way it turned out was like this. And so we did this library, and then each one of the, uh, each one of the libra libraries was, was, uh, uh, had a specially trained, hand-picked librarian who was going to be the proprietor of the library. And they all had taken special classes up at Syracuse University's library school, and they all knew each other. And then they found out that this library didn't just have a logo, it had this mural. So everyone then had to have a mural. And so for some reason, we then made a fatal decision, which was that every mural had to look different. Because I remember saying, this isn't Starbucks. We're not trying to make it look like a franchise. We want to kind of really make each one special. So we embarked on doing illustrations of the kids, kind of Andy Warholian takes on it. Hired a, a graphic novelist illustrator to interview kids, draw portraits of them, and have their quotes. And then um, started working with other designers who would come in, like Raphael Square, and do this delirious sort of silhouette montage using subjects in the books to kind of create this little potpourri. Or um, uh, Charles Whitkin, who did this uh, uh, treatment of this collage like this. Or um, uh, Nicola, uh, uh, Christopher Neiman, who did uh, Christoph Neiman, who did these amazing murals that incorporated books into people's faces and the subjects of the books themselves. Moby Dick, uh, Shakespeare, um, you know, uh, the American Eagle. Uh, Myra Coleman did this amazing installation of objects all the way around. Uh, Stefan Sagmeister did a manga sort of treatment. Uh, kind of around. So these murals ended up being really fun to do, and um, you know everyone was happy. And particularly, who was happy was um, uh, the, the the schools and the kids. And I started getting these little invitations that would say, "You were invited to the opening of the library. You show up at something like Public School 10 in Brooklyn, and you'd be greeted. There'd be balloons. They were opening the library. A student." Uh, ambassador would greet you at the door. There'd be a ceremony where the kids would have written little poems about the, the inaugurating the new library. Then there'd be a little reception afterwards with fruit punch and snacks. People would come up to me and say, why are you here, mister? And I'd say, well, I'm the consulting graphic designer. And they said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, I, you know, that sign over the door, I did that. And they said, they, and I, well, they'd say, did you do these pictures? And I said, no, a photographer took those. They said, what did you do? I said, that sign over the door. They said, the sign that says library? <laughs> and I said, yes, I came up with that. And they're like, okay. So, um, so it was, um, we did this with love and enthusiasm all the way through. And I would say with humility in the end. We were humbled over and over again by sort of misjudging what the assignment was, who the client was, who the audience was, and what our role was meant to be. But it all came home sort of midway through the process when um, having been to some of these receptions, I said to my team, um, hey, we should just rent a van hire a van, and then just go around to as many of these libraries as we can in one day, just so you guys who have been working on it back in the studio can kind of see what these things look like when they're up and running. And so, you know, there are uh, uh, 60 of them now. We didn't go to 60, but they serve 40,000 students a year. We went around and we visited probably a half dozen, six, seven of them, and we ended up in one just at the end of the school day. It was the winter, so it was getting dark. And the librarian said, I'm going to show you how I turn out the lights. I've got a special way of doing it. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, I turn them out like this. She started turning them out. And the last, and then she said, this is the last light I turn out every night. And it's the light that illuminates the faces of the kids above the shelves. And she said, I do this to remind myself why I come to work every day. And then, and only then, did I realize how it was supposed to work. Like, th those kids aren't inspired by my logo. What they're inspired by is the passion of that librarian, who in turn is inspired by the sense that people, unknown to her, it was a woman, unknown to her had somehow created an environment for her to do her very best work. It wasn't just me, it was the architects, it was the people that donated the books, it was the funding that sent her and her colleagues to library, uh, get special library training. All those things made her 10 times more effective as a librarian. And part of those things were design, if you ask me. So to the degree that design can change the world, I don't think it will happen because somehow 
someone in this room comes up with uh, the big idea that actually reverses climate change, although let's give it a shot. <laughs> Instead, while we're doing that, and this gets to that I the idea of big and small at once that we were talking about, if you could just remember that every time you're doing a project that's going to be put out into the world, it has the capacity and the opportunity and the potential and the promise to change someone's lives. Maybe just one at a time, maybe in a small way, maybe it's incremental. But 40,000 students a year over 15 years starts to add up. And if all of us just kind of keep doing that addition, the multiplication and the exponential factor kicks in, and maybe we can just change things a little bit. So let's try. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah.